introduce Joy Meekings. Now Joy is a neighbour of mine and has been for the 10 years that we lived where we live, and she's been there longer than that. Um, she's a 10 pound palm, as is indicated, from Essex, and she arrived here in 1970 solo. She's been a member of U3A since its inception in 2013, and Joy studied playwriting at a course at U3A. She is now a playwriter with many recordings of her plays on Southern FM and at the Beaumaris Theatre. In fact, she's enjoyed a three-night sellout there recently, which is good. Her style is similar to Pam Ayres. Joy's presentation is titled 10 Pound Pom Plus Pounds. There's alliteration for you. Welcome, Joy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just get my best sign. Thank you so much for having me here today and um, thank you Keith for such a good welcome and getting me a cup of tea. I normally get my own. <laughs> Can I ask if there are any other 10 pound poms here today? Ah, oh, one. Oh God, look at them. Oh, 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 and over there too, you're in the corner. Oh wow, so, oh, and, and No, you... I came first class. <laughs> <laughs> There's one in every group. <laughs> Pardon? Okay. Fair enough. So when did you come out? Many years ago? Or I don't I don't want to go uh, through everyone. Nineteen sixty five. Ah, before me. Okay. Sixty three. Sixty three is oh yeah, okay. So sixty nine over there, okay. Sixty nine. Sixty nine. Oh. Can't see that one, but good on you. Yeah, he is. You must have come out with your family, you don't look that old. <laughs> I can't see though, the sun's in my eyes. Um, <laughs> look, I, I'm just, but it's good to know there's other 10 pound ponds here. My journey out here started in 1969. I was working as a secretary in London and one night coming home on the train, I opened the evening paper and there was a whole page advert saying, white collar workers needed in Australia, come to sunny Australia for 10 pound. And they had a lovely drawing of a hunky surfer on his surfboard and that probably got me in more than anything else. <laughs> and I thought, this is great, 10 pound? You've got to ring Australia House. So I, I did the next day. I didn't tell my parents, I lived at home but I thought I'll just check it out. So I went to Australia House and they did a really good presentation. They showed us movies on Sydney and Melbourne because I think all the other cities weren't cities then in 69. They would have been towns really. So they, I think. Um, so I like the look of Sydney and they told us that if you did the 10 pound scheme, you had to stay for two years. If you came back before then, you paid the government back the full fare. And I thought that was fair enough, because I thought, I'll just come out for an adventure, to around Australia and go home. Ha ha. I didn't realise how, how vast Australia is either. Anyway, I decided to come, told my mum and dad, who were quite shocked, but incredibly supportive, which was marvellous. And I then, through all the procedures and whatever else you have to do, I left for Sydney, September 1970, and I decided to go by plane. Probably the worst thing I could have done when you hear the story, but I didn't want to go six weeks boat. So on that fateful day, the 11th of September 1970, said goodbye to friends and family at Heathrow, got on the plane, which then was just the 727 or 737, the planes we have here that go to Sydney, Brisbane, just a small aisle down the middle, three seats either side. And as we took off, I can remember thinking, what have I done? Reality hit. I thought, I'm on my own. I have no job. I don't know anyone there. I have some accommodation booked but that was it. 
Anyway, I sat next to a lovely lady. I thought she was elderly. She was 30. I was 20. So she's telling me that she was divorced and starting a new life and maybe, you know, we could keep in touch. And I thought, well, not really. You're really old. You know, I don't want to be with someone. I want to be with younger people. Um, it's silly what you think of when you're 20. Anyway, um, we, we, in those days, you didn't have the long haul sort of le legs that you have these days. So we were sort of down at Paris, then up, down at Rome. Then we got to Dubai. Mm. And our plane was surrounded by military with their rifles drawn. There'd been two planes hijacked. You might remember this. In the de it was just near Dubai Airport in the desert. And they'd asked for a ransom or they were going to blow them up. They had the passengers were off the plane. And they did blow them up. Not while we were there, thank goodness, but they did. Um, so we couldn't get off the plane. And there were children. There were mainly families coming out, not single people. Anyway, everyone was a bit upset because um, the captain came over the intercom saying, you know, there's these planes, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, we took off and landed next at Bombay. Guess what? Military surrounded our plane with rifles drawn. I couldn't have written this in a play, I tell you. And the captain came over and said, there's been a coup. We're not allowed off the plane. Now, we'd been on this plane for probably 16, 18 hours. Everyone was fed up. You go with it, don't you? You have to. Then we landed at Singapore. We could get off, hallelujah. And we, the, it was the old airport then, which wasn't very pleasant, but you know, you do what you do. <coughs> so we were all so happy to get off and go around, walk around the airport. They say 10,000 steps these days. I think we all did about 100,000 because we'd been on the plane for about 24 hours by then. Then we get to Darwin, and we were going to be processed at Darwin. This was about 6 a.m. in the morning. Front door shoots open. Two burly guys get on and start spraying down the plane. Spray! Spray! Real thick spray. And one of the guys, you know, the, the other pond said, you know, hey, what are you doing? He said, we meet every Australia, uh, every international flight and we spray for bugs and bacteria. <laughs> and one of the other guys said, well, we don't do that in, in London. He said, well, you've probably got a lot of bugs and bacteria in London. <laughs> and we were, we were just so upset because we thought, good God, we've come all this way and we're getting sprayed. <laughs> And then we get off the plane, we had to walk across the tarmac, and Darwin Airport in 1970 was just a corrugated iron, literally tin shack. And we walked in, and there's the ceiling fans going, and the one saving grace for the ladies, I think, on the plane, were the lovely Aussie customs officers who were in white shirts, white shorts, long white socks and white shoes because I hope the the English if there are there are some English men here but in the 60s the English men in summer used to wear a shirt shorts ankle socks that were black with their sandals which wasn't very romantic so we were all like oh these Aussie guys are rather nice and then we queued up and we were processed. And when I got to the counter, this guy looked up and said, G'day, how you's going? And I thought, wow, do I tell him that we've had a journey of a bit of a lifetime here, surrounded by military, you know, at Dubai and Bombay. We've been sprayed within an inch of our life on the plane. Don't think it's a good welcome. But if I say that, he might not stamp my papers. So I didn't. I said, it's been an adventure. So he said, oh, okay, welcome to Australia. Anyway, then we stopped at Brisbane, tiny little town that was. 
Only a few people got off. Then we came into Sydney and it was brilliant. The pilot went over Sydney Harbour Bridge because the Opera House wasn't there. That wasn't built till 73. And it looked marvellous and I thought, great. Pat gave me her phone number and said, give me a ring because she was staying with a couple of friends. Um, and I thought, well, I won't. But luckily, luckily, I put it in my pocket. Then, get out at Sydney Airport. Walk out, We'd been, I'd been processed, so walk out and going through the foyer or whatever, the exit <coughs> place, a vicar comes up to me and he says, our church runs a program where we meet as many international flights as we can and we like to ask any of the single, young single ladies, you know, have you got anyone here? Have you got a job or accommodation? And I thought that was brilliant, actually. It was a very good initiative. So I said, well, I don't know anyone. I don't have a job, but I've got accommodation. He said, oh, where are, where are you staying? I said, well, in Australia House, they had posters up and it showed pictures of accommodation and you could book in advance. This was where you had to send a cheque and all the rest of it. There was no email and mobile phones back then. And I said, I, I saw this beautiful terraced house and I thought, oh, it's in a, a suburb that I know well in London, which is a really good business district. So I thought it's probably a business district that has some accommodation. And he said, where's that? And I said, oh, King's Cross. <laughs> Absolutely a dump. It was all dilapidated. It was awful. And I said to the cabbie, you know, this isn't, this isn't the right place. You've got the wrong place. He said, no, this is the address. And I said, can't be. I said, at Australia House in London, it was beautiful, the photo. And he said, love, they took that photo in 1860. <laughs> so I said, oh, God. You know, anyway, you had to get the keys for the place at the Goldfish Bowl Cafe on the corner of the, of the street. And I went in and it was, you went up at sort of uh, uh, some steps. There was a basement, ground floor, first floor, three rooms on every floor. I was on the first floor and I went up there with my suitcases. Now I'd probably traveled for 36 hours by now, didn't, hadn't had any sleep. And as I got round, saw my room number, someone opened their room, looked out and shut the door. You know, and I thought, gee, these Australians are really strange. Don't like this. I opened the door. My heart dropped. It was the... Can't, to call it sparse was, yeah, being good. Two single beds. My wardrobe was a pole with hessian sacking on it. You walked down a step to a little galley kitchen which had a tiny fridge and a two-ringed gas burner and a cold water tap. Now, I, was, I lived in a council flat in, in Essex, no worries there, and my mum kept a good home. And I just thought, my God, my God. And two of everything, minimum, you know, tiny little um, carton of milk, two tea bags, a little bit of coffee, two of everything. And I just went and sat on one of the beds and burst into tears and thought, what have I done? I've come to a dump. It's not very pleasant at all. But I thought, okay, you're here. You try and make the best of it. So I thought, I'll have a bath. I loved my bath. I love my bath. Went out. All there was was a loo, which was a bit dubious anyway, looking, and a shower. I thought, this isn't good at all. Anyway, I had a long sleep, and I got to go at the goldfish bowl. They had... Um, milk and bread and a few things there. So I went over and I got talking to the couple running it who were lovely. I thought they were old, they were probably in their early 40s, you know, but they were like a surrogate mum and dad, I think. And of course, the, the Vietnam War was on, so there were all the GIs there on R&R. &R. And I got talking to some of them. They were just lovely young men. They used to stand up. When you went over, they'd stand up Hello, ma'am. They always called me ma'am. It was a bit weird, but it was very respectful. And I'd be saying to them, you know, oh, I don't want to 
be here, it's horrible, I don't like it. And they'd be saying, we don't want to be here either, we want to be home. And they showed me pictures of either families or their wives. And the sad thing is I'll never know if they all got home. I never will, but they were lovely and I, I don't forget that. And I used to talk to some of the prostitutes. I did, I, I was lonely. I would have talked, talking to anyone, but those girls had some of the saddest stories too. So I used to buy them coffee and have a chat, you know, it was, there you go. I was jet lagged, so I didn't start looking for a job straight away. I'd been there about a week, and one morning, it was about 1am and... Police, open up. I thought, oh my God. And I sort of got out of bed and I said, Who's that again? And he said, drug raid, police. Drug raid, good God. So I opened the door and there are two police there, one older one, one younger one. And he said, oh, you're a new face. And I thought, geez, they must come here all the time. <laughs> this is awful. Um, so he came in and I think they did a pretend sort of look on him. And he said to me, the older guy, love, no, but they always used to call me love, love. <laughs> You shouldn't be here, he said. You get out of King's Cross. He said, I think you should be living somewhere else. And I said, I don't know anyone. He said, no one? I said, no. And then I said, yes. I've got the lady I sat next to on, on, the, on the plane. She's living at a suburb called Rose Bay. And he said, that's where you should go. That's exactly where you should be. Get yourself to Rose Bay. He said, that's where you should be. I said, oh, I think so. Anyway, the next day, I wrote a 13-page letter to my parents telling them everything. I was living in a dump, there were drug addicts there, police raid, prostitutes, American GIs, and I hated it. The two air letters I got back couldn't have been so different. My mum's letter said, get out of there, pack your suitcase, your bed's ready, get home, sounds terrible. But Dad, bless his heart, knew me very well too. Knew me more than I knew myself. And his was, Dad was a very quiet, calm man. He just said, Joy, you took a nearly a year to get out there with everything you had to do. Give it three months, you'll get a job, you'll make friends. And if it doesn't work out, then come back. But please get out of King's Cross and P.S. I'll take care of your mother. <laughs> so I rang Pat, and um, I rang Pat, and you know she was a, there's a was a housekeeper at the the place she was at, who answered the phone, and Pat came on, and you know she said, "Oh, it's good to hear from you," because I was a bit desperate. I didn't think I'd ever ring her. How are you? You know. Oh my God, Pat. Oh my God. Yeah. Told her everything, and she said, oh my goodness. She said, how weird, how strange. We've got three rooms here, and, and a lady's moving out tomorrow. It was serendipity, I think. And she said, would you like to come here? I said, well, what's Rose Bay lunch? Like? Oh, it's lovely. Um, but she said a weird thing about Aussies, the house, we have a live-in housekeeper, and she lives out the back in a granny flat. And I said, what's a granny flat? She, I don't know, it's like a, they're all bungalows here anyway. So she said, she lives out the back. So I said, all right. So Mrs. Hobson was a name, lovely woman, came on the phone, hello, you know, and I said, oh, haven't got references. I've lived at home and just got work references. She said, okay, come down. So I got the, I got the bus and going out of, King's Cross, going into Double Bay and then Rose Bay, I thought, this is Australia, this is what I thought it would be like. So I got to the house, it was a, a Californian bungalow, beautiful. Got in there, saw Pat quickly and then Mrs Hobson opened the door to the room I'd be having and I said, oh you've got a wardrobe. And she said, well of course we've got a wardrobe and a chest of drawers. She said, wherever are you staying? I said, oh, King's Cross, and all I've got for a wardrobe is a pole and hessian sacking. She said, I don't think your mother would want you living there. I said, don't worry about my mother. I don't want to live there, let alone my mother worrying about me. So I took on, took on the flat, and it had, you know, anyway, it was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So um, 
you know, it was it was really great. That's that's how I came to be at Rose Bay, and uh, that's my journey here to Melbourne. So I'm um, I'm looking at my little notes because I hate hate having notes where people are looking like this. I think I've told you everything. So um, and then I'll ask if there's any questions, and then I'll read a few poems if that's okay. Thank you. Any questions? Do you ever know where the ten pounds went? Did that stay in England or come to Australia? <laughs> I would hope it came to Australia, I think. I don't know. Does Any... anybody know? No, I don't. Google Does it, anyone Roger? know? Yeah, yeah, Google it. It had Google to be it. for the insecticide. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> most probably that's what it would have done too, for sure. For sure. Joy, that's lovely. Thank you. Into some poems. I will. Okay. So how did you get to Melbourne? Oh, um... I actually met, you know, whirlwind romance and uh, married a, a chap. It didn't last, unfortunately, but he couldn't find a, a decent job in Sydney, so we came to Melbourne. That's the reason, yeah. I probably might have done anyway, but, um, yeah, that's why. But thank you. Okay, now I'll do some poems. Not many. They're only a minute each. Pam Ayers is my hero, and I try and be like her. I'll read you the very first poem I wrote, which was eight years ago. Before I went to U3, I had never written in my life, so it's called The Lamp. Found a lamp in an antique shop. It looked so very old. Bought it as I hoped it would be made of solid gold. Took it home straight into the shed. Must clean it up before going to bed. So very tarnished it became a trial, though pretty soon I began to smile. For all my efforts to make it much finer had revealed on its bottom, made in China. <laughs> <laughs> and this poem is very close to my heart, so it's called Free Range. There once was a chicken named Thelma. Her life was not going so well, for she was a battery hen and confined to a living hell. She thought she would never be rescued and be out in the sun all day long. She'd imagine blue sky, gentle breezes, pecking the earth, feeling strong. Her dream was to be a free ranger, for that was the best she could be. Oh, to be out in the open, maybe sitting under a tree. The monsters running this prison were convicted and now doing time confined to a very small cell. But does their punishment fit the crime? Most of Thelma's companions were unlucky, so mistreated they had to die. Thelma survived and is thriving. I thought you'd like to know why. Adopted by a good family, she's so much more than free range, has all she could ever dream of after thinking her life would not change. Her feathers have grown back completely. She looks and feels so well. Rarely thinks of her former life, for it does no good to dwell. Everyone, please take notice, for we can bring about change. Let's either keep chickens of our own, or always buy free range. <laughs> one, I've got one more, and then I, if you indulge me, I'll then just read a Panair's poem that's one of my favourites, so I won't bore you to death, alright? Oh, this is the Aussie fly. I'm going to a barbecue. I love grilled sausages in bread, but I'll need to take the aero guard as flies. Oh, guys, I really dread. A fly is only very small, but can be such a pain. I try hard to outsmart them, but my efforts are in vain. Even if you head indoors to try and eat your food, their radar still finds you. They really are so rude. I only wish they could do something that is beneficial. Could not the military employ them so they become official? Imagine training Aussie flies sending millions into action. The enemy wouldn't stand a chance as the fly has no distraction. Once focused on its target, an Aussie fly never gives in. Whether it's food, sweat or the enemy won't stop until it wins. But I will never like them no matter what good deeds they do. I'll keep using Aeroguard and swatting them. 
Will you? <laughs> Thank you, everyone. My last one is a Pam Ayers favourite, and it's called My Sat Nav, and I think it will appeal to all of you lovely men out there. I have a little sat nav. It sits there in my car. A sat nav is a driver's friend. It tells you where you are. I have a little sat nav. I've had it all my life. It's better than the normal ones. My sat nav is my wife. <laughs> it gives me full instructions, especially how to drive. It's 60 miles an hour, it says. You're doing 65. It tells me when to stop and start and when to use the brake and tells me that it's never, ever safe to overtake. It tells me when a light is red and when it goes to green. It seems to know instinctively just when to intervene. It lists the vehicles just in front and those all to the rear. And taking this into account, it specifies my gear. I'm sure no other driver has so helpful a device. For when we leave and lock the car, it still gives its advice. It fills me up with counselling. Each journey's pretty fraught. So why don't I exchange it and get a quieter sort? Ah, uh, well, you see, it cleans the house, makes sure I'm properly fed. It washes all my shirts and things and keeps me warm in bed. Despite all these advantages and my tendency to scoff, I only wish that now and then I could turn the bugger off. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Joy, well, that's, that's really beautiful. Um, a bit of your history involves working in education or yes. working, yes. Tell yes. us about that. Oh. Oh. Question without notice. Yes, it is. Oh. Wow. Um, I worked at BHP for many years and was retrenched when Billiton took them over. And then a friend of mine was working at St. Leonard's College as secretary at middle school and was taking three months leave. And she asked if I'd do a job. So I went there and that's where I met Simon's son, Chris. He was uh, head of middle school. Well, Michael Barr was there first, but then Chris anyway. And I thought it would be a doddle, you know, a real doddle, because I'd never worked at a school. It was the best job I've ever had, but the hardest. I realised how hard teachers work, amazingly so. But I loved the students, they were just brilliant. Um, couldn't have asked for better students at all, so um, I don't know what else I can tell you. I can't think of any quick, quick-witted... Um, things to say about any of them really. It's not like you. No, it's not. I, I can remember a young lad, we had some lads who had autism or Asperger's and lovely, lovely kids and one of them, he used to come in at break time and just to, with Angela, my friend, he knew her very, she'd been there years, but he didn't know me very well and Asperger's people tell you right down the middle what they think. They don't have any filter really. Anyway, he's sitting there one day below where my, there was a sort of wall there or a, anyway, there was a sort of desk bit up here and mid, high, the um, upper school kids must have found out there's a new woman in middle school, let's go and use the phone and not pay. You're supposed to pay 50 cents each time you use the phone. So this young lad came in and I said to him, you, you, you're not middle school. He, he said, well, no, no, but uh, can I use the phone? I said, yeah, you've got to pay 50 cents though. He said, what? And the young lad who was the Asperger's, he said, yes, you do. It's been in force since September the 10th, you know, 19 whatever. And everyone has to pay. He knew it off by heart and this upper school boy was out of there like I don't know what. So that was quite funny. Sorry, you probably had to be there, but it was quite good. So he was my pal, this chap. I wish I could remember his name, Otis or something, but he was lovely. I can't think of anything else too exciting or funny to tell you, but I love I love being there. I love the kids too. Beautiful. Thanks, Joy, so much. It's been a real pleasure to hear you and enjoy your poems and, and your history. It's probably not unique as a 10 pound poem. I guess a few people have been through those similar realizations on arrival and we can talk with our friends here, our members who yeah. had to endure that. Yeah. Gentlemen, let's put our hands together and thank Joy for this.
that I'll call on David to provide a little badge of thanks. I thank you, I beg your pardon. Thank you. Enjoy us, so poet lovers have to stick together, so I've been <laughs> selected to say thank you. You've been very brave uh, to come out all the way to Australia, the other side of the planet, by yourself. It reminds me that we are all travellers. Uh, even our Indigenous people came from somewhere, although they don't often admit it. And I often wonder why they ended up in Tasmania. It's because another mob came and drove them out. So it happens all the time. But thank you for your insights, and uh, we did get a lot of happiness and entertainment from your talk. Thank you. I'd like you to have this as a token of our appreciation, and I hope you put it to good use. Oh, Are you a, one of those people? Oh, yeah. Good work. <laughs> Thank you.